Electrostatics, transmission lines, and usually a magnetostatic problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, towards the end. Is this, what is this the third week of class? Yes. Uh, usually, I mean, it's a ten-week course, so we'll get it about the fifth week, I think. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, man. I said like uh, on the two, you see, they said like test one, so it's like just on the two. Well, there's a final exam. One test because the summer's compacted. So I mean, we can take it. We can get it after the. It's usually smart to get it about two thirds of the way through the course. So we've done transmission lines. We're going to do electrostatics. We're doing electrostatics. Then we'll do magnetostatics. That includes inductance. And then the final part of this probably getting late. But usually about in the third of the way through, uh, magnetostatics is a good time for a test because you don't have. It's far enough into the semester, but it's serious. Uh, if you give one in the first first three weeks, um, I'm just telling you, I don't think a lot of kids have really revved up yet. Uh, but it gets it, 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 this course gets progressively more work per day uh, as you go through it, and you'll have to remember everything too. So it means you've got to be working stuff constantly. There's just one test outside of the final, and it's there's a midterm, right? and there's a final, and then there's quizzes. Because yeah. you get a quiz every week that's going to yeah. count. Which is about, you know, actually, I think I have more tests in on average hourly. Uh, I mean, if you look at the percentage of class stuff, than most classes, because I get the quizzes. All right. Um, so, besides that, any questions about the homework? I gave you a sets of homework, right? Of divergence B. I hope you all did it. It's real important to keep up with this because here's where it gets real confusing real quick. All right. Um, so, no questions at all? All right. Well, I think I should do at least one problem with using uh, Gauss's law to try to show you the power of this. So, when we talk about Gauss's law, There's two forms. The first is the one that we use, and we use this for highly symmetric cases, things where the electric field and the D field are very symmetrically distributed. For instance, shells of charge with constant charge density, line charges, uh, cylinders of charge, surfaces of constant charge. So this is Gauss's law. So the integral of D dot Vs is equal to the charge enclosed. Right? Everything inside there, this is a closed integral. So I'm just going to tell you a few things about Gauss's law, then we're going to do a problem. You always, if you're going to apply Gauss's law to get the D field and then get the E field, oh, remember this too. That D is equal to epsilon E, and for now, epsilon naught. This is for free space. It means space that does not have a material in it that's different than a vacuum or air. So the first one I'm going to do is for the case of the uh, cylinder. So when I have a cylinder, and this is true of any cylindrical charge distribution, cylindrically symmetric. A cylindrically symmetric charge distribution, Q. It doesn't matter how it varies volumetrically or uh, really spatially, as long as it's cylindrically symmetric, which usually means, I mean, it has to mean it's invariant with Z. If it's uh, if the, if you use the Z axis as the axis of symmetry. So here, if this is the Z axis, all right, and we can come up with any type of charge configuration. I'm going to come up with the classic one. I'm going to come out here at distance A, and I'm going to put a sheet of charge around there. 
and this sheet of charge is going to have a charge density rho s. And then I'm going to come out of radius b. This is a coax cable. And at radius b, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put another sheet of charge here, uh, rho s2, that you have to figure out such that the total electric field for radial distance rho, I mean the D field, rho greater than uh, B, I want D rho to be zero. So we've got to find rho S2. We know rho S1. You all with me this? All right, so these are long cylinders, infinitely long. There's a surface charge density on the inner surface. This is just like a coax cable, by the way. You, except the inner surface is really just the wire. I mean, it's not normally, the radius is very small, it's just a solid wire, but all the charge resides on the surface of the wire. And then we go out here, but here we just have a surface charge density, rho s. So here we go with Gauss's law. There's three regions in this problem, and it's real important that you appreciate this. The first region, I'll call it region one, would be for A less than zero. That's inside the cylinder. And this is invariant with Z. The second region is the region between A and B. You all see that, right? And the third region is going to be the region outside rho equal B. So when we come down here, We'll start with region one and we'll say for rho less than or equal to A, I know something is true. I know the integral of B dot dS over the surface is equal to the charge enclosed by that surface, right? Now, before I go about solving this, I want to show you something here. We've got to create this imaginary surface that will fit around our symmetric charge distribution symmetrically. Now look, I'm going to come out at distance rho, and I'm going to put a little cylinder. Can you all imagine this in your minds? It's going to be aligned with the z-axis, concentric about the z-axis, of radius rho. Now do you all agree, just for looking at the problem, the d-field has to be radially away. It cannot be a function of height z. Right? The other thing that's important to notice about D, if you come out of radial distance rho and start rotating it in the phi direction, the D field's magnitude will be the same. If you look at the problem, and this is how you can tell cylindrically symmetric cases, it doesn't matter at a given distance rho away from the center, what angle I'm looking at, it looks the same. Y'all follow that? Cylindrically symmetric. So for this, when I say the integral of d dot ds is equal to charge enclosed, my region, and I'll put it here, I'm going to assume the region has a radial distance of rho and a height here of h. h can be 1. And I tell people oftentimes, if you're ever giving an option to choose a variable, choose the one that's the easiest to deal with. Make it 1. If you can't mess that up, if you forget to divide it out, it's still, no, it's still okay. So when I look at the integral of d dot ds, what I'm really looking at is the integral of the outer surface area, right? I'm gonna put this down here for cylindrical coordinates. The differential surface is the outer surface on, for cylindrical, a cylindrical coordinate system when I'm at that curved surface, right? Now remember this, the differential surface has a magnitude all right, of really the differentials in the two directions in a direction that's perpendicular to that planar surface. So for this one, ds, I'll put it right here, ds would be equal to rho d phi, that's this differential, and then it's times the differential in height, dz. Now, what direction would the actual differential surface be? Anyone. I'm trying to get you guys to interact. This it'll stay with you long. Well, can it be in Z? No. Mm -hmm. Can it be in phi? No. Right? Phi is going to be circulate. 
has to be in the A row direction. Y'all follow me on that? Remember the unit vectors are what? Are, uh, when you talk about this, it's gonna be A row, right? A, Z, and then A, B kind of swirls around. It goes in this direction. It's always perpendicular to row. Correct, Clive? All right, so this means it has to be in the A row direction. That's the differential surface. We also know that the D field has to have just the D row component, correct? There can't be a D phi and a DZ component because of symmetry. Y'all agree with that? Right? So when I come here and I talk about the integral of D dot DS for this case, this will be the same for every, every case. It's really going to be a double integral of the differential or of the D field, which is D of rho in the A rho direction. And it's the dot product of that dot DS. And DS in this case is going to be rho D phi DZ A rho. Here, phi will go from 0 to 2 pi. Y'all with me on this? All the way around. And where will z go from? 0 to 1. From the lower part to the up from 0 to 1. Do y'all agree with that? Because I, I, you could say 0 to h, but I like making h1. Now, when you do this, that's the charge enclosed. Take a look at this. What is this going to be? Well, when I integrate d phi, I just get phi evaluated from 0 to 2 pi is 2 pi. And when I integrate z, I get z from 0 to 1 is just 1. So this is simply 2 pi rho times d rho. Are you with me, everyone? This will always be the same for any cylindrical coordinate system. You'll always get the integral of d dot ds if it's a cylindrical coordinate system symmetric cylindrically. There will be no D field with Z or phi direction, and you will always get 2 pi rho times D rho. Now, do you remember what the different, or what the surface is of, of a can? If you have a can of radius A, do you all remember the perimeter of the can would be 2 pi A, two right? Pi a. Times the height, correct? Well, it's, that's the only thing I'm doing. I'm saying this is, the, this is the area, 2 pi, and the height is just 2 pi rho, and the height is 1, so that's it. Now, how much charge is enclosed in region 1? This is region 1. Think about this. Is there any charge inside this cylinder right here, class? No. I put all the charge at a surface of a radial distance of A, right? We're inside of A. You all with me on this? So that means it's zero. What does that tell you about the D field? This one. If I got zero and I divided by two pi, it is still zero. Yes. As a matter of fact, inside where the charge exists, the D field is zero. So you could say D equals zero there if you want. You all with me? And that's absolutely true all the time. Now we go to the second region. Now we're at the region where rho is going to be greater than or equal to A, less than or equal to B. All right. Here we do the same thing. We say the integral of D dot DS over that surface, it's a closed integral, is equal to the, it's the integral of the charge inside, which is really going to be, let me just put Q inside, or Q enclosed. So now we're in this region, right here, between A and B. You with me? I can go ahead and put another cylinder, a pipe H as such, right? I know my integration of this is going to be the same as it was earlier. Here it's going to be 2 pi rho times D rho. I know that's going to happen. Do you all agree with me? All right, now what's on the other side? Well, how much charge is enclosed? I want you to take a look at this. I put all the charge at a radius A, didn't I? So here what I need to do is find out the amount of charge on that surface 
And to do that, that's a surface integral, so it's going to be a double integral. And I take the charge density, rho s, times the differential amount of charge, or differential surface, pardon me. And you all remember the differential surface, I put it right here, will be just, um, it's rho d phi dz, correct? Now it's not a dot product, so it's just the magnitude of the surface area. So it's going to be times rho d phi dz. You all agree that would be the charge on the surface, right? Inside height one. So here I say phi goes from zero to two pi, and I say z goes from zero to one. And now I find out that this integral will be rho s, right? And then it's going to be times rho. And when I integrate d phi from 0 to 2 pi, I get phi from 0 to 2 pi is just 2 pi. And when I go from 0 to 1 z, I get 1. And I see that this is 2 pi t. This is 2 pi a, not rho. Rho is A for this one. Y'all follow me on that? Because the surface as it is at a fixed distance A. Here, Rho is between A and B. And we get this. Do y'all agree with that? That's the integral of D dot DS between A and B. And that's the charge. Now, one thing you'll note is the two pi's cancel right off the bat, don't they? And I get the D field between these regions would be equal to rho s times a over rho. And rho is the radial distance. And in fact, that is the right answer for the D field between a and b. You can see one thing. It falls off as 1 over rho, right? OK? Now, I made a stipulation that I wanted the D field outside of B to be zero. By the way, this is the way a coax cable actually works. It shields everything to make sure there's no electric field outside the outer shield. You all know what a coax is, don't you? Coaxial cable? You know, like spectrum internet or whatever internet Perfect comes to you. Has a coaxial cable has an outer metallic sleeve that's woven. It's aluminum, actually. And then it has an inner core, and it's got an insulator in between the two. Now, in that case, I, I'm, we'll get into that more when we emag too, but for a coaxial cable, it is the perfect transmission line in a lot of senses. It doesn't have an electric field outside, technically, outside where the outer sleeve is. Okay, or where that what the is. So that's the D field in between the inner and outer conductor. Finally, in region three, when we take a look at, this is for rho greater than B. Here, we have to write down Gauss's law, the integral of D dot DS over the surface, closed surface, is equal to the charge enclosed. Y'all with me? Now, I know this, the integral of d dot ds will be 2 pi rho right, times d rho. I don't need to keep doing that. d rho times 2 pi rho, or rho is the radial distance. And now I'm out here, by the way. I'm way out here. My cylinder, and this is called a Gaussian surface. It's an imaginary cylinder surface I put in. And I'm saying that all the integral of, the integral of d dot ds is only going to penetrate the outer surface is equal to the charge enclosed. Now I need the charge enclosed. Well, there's two places where charge can be enclosed. The first is at A, right? It's all that charge on a length of one. So that, we have already done that one. Zero. Yeah. And that's gonna be what? Rho S, if you look down here, it would be Rho S A times two pi, right? Remember we just did this? This would be the amount of charge inside of surf, uh, on the surface A, right? So it would be equal to 2 pi rho s, that's the rho s on surface A, 
and it's going to be times a. Right? It's two pi a's. The circumference height is one times rho s. But then I have a charge also on this surface at radius b gone. You all follow me? All right, what's that? Well, wouldn't it just be the area times the surface charge density? Wouldn't it be the outer surface area right, times the charge? What's the outer surface area? It's the perimeter 2 pi b, or circumference, right? 2 pi b times the height of y times rho s2. So I say that plus rho s2, I might as well label this rho s1, times 2 pi, and now it's going to be b, that'll work, right? But what do we know? What was the condition? In general, if you had rho s2 here, we're going to, I mean, suppose rho s2 and rho s1, when the effects are combined, it didn't give a d field of zero, then what would it be? That's a good question. Well, then what happens? Can you all see this right here? You all see the two pi's cancel, right? Yeah. They go away. Now the next thing you'll notice is I can go ahead and factor the rho s1 times a plus rho s2 times b. And then I can divide that by distance rho and in fact, that would be the D field, D of rho, for rho greater than B, right? For any charge, any surface charge it'd be, correct class? And what would rho S at B have to be if we wanted this D to be zero out here? D rho would be equal to zero for what? Just look at it. Wouldn't it be rho S A plus rho S 2 B equals zero? Yes. Right? If the top part's zero, it's zero. So in that case, if rho S A, rho S 1 times A, I guess you put that a little further. What I need to do is find rho S B. So I'd say rho S back. Rho S 1 times A plus rho s2 times b equal to zero. And I take rho s2 to the other side and I divide both sides by b and I get rho s2 is equal to minus rho s1 times a divided by b. And that would be the condition. Do you all follow me in that class? Can you see it, buddy? Only thing I'm doing is saying that I'm making this zero. So that means rho s2 has to be minus rho s1 times a over b. Okay. Pardon? So now we have to see if it's zero. So. But if it was, if I gave you two charge densities, then you could get it using that equation I put right on top there. Okay? Now it's real important you follow me on that. I'm going to do one more problem. And remember, it's the total charge enclosed in the region you always worry about. All right, next. I'll do one more before we move on. Gauss's law is something so, so important for certain problems, certain types of problems. Now, the next one I'm going to do, I want to do a problem out of the book that I gave you. I don't know if you did or not. And you'd be smart to do all the problems I give you because um, you're going to 
these things will pile up on you very quickly if you don't. So, um, 335, it says we got a spherically, char uh, spherically symmetric charge distribution given by rho B equals rho A R over A. And we want to derive equations for the electric flux density everywhere. Now, this is a typical kind of problem. It requires some forethought and insight and an understanding of physics. And this is like for a test problem, I give these kind of problems. You're either going to get a planar, a cylindrical, or a spherical problem that's requiring you to understand Gauss's law. So up here, it's a spherical coordinate system. And we basically have a ball. I mean, we have a sphere of radius A. And inside that sphere, we have the volume charge density equal to some rho V zero, right? And then it's gonna be times R over A, and that's coulombs per meter cubed. You can look at the problem. This is problem uh, 35, I believe. So that's inside there, and then it's rho v equals zero for r greater than a. So all the charges inside it. Do y'all follow me on that class? Now, when you're doing a problem like this, there are really two regions. The first region is for r less than a. This would be region one. And the second region would be region two for R greater than A. Y'all follow me on that? You're either inside or outside where the charge density exists. So, I'm gonna start with region two. This is gonna be for R, this is spherical coordinates, less than or equal to A. In this case, we have the integral of V dot Vs over closed surface is equal to the integral, and now in this case, it's rho V dV. It's the volume charge density inside that region, right? Now here's where you gotta take, have to be careful here. So I'm always gonna create a Gaussian surface. Do you all agree it's spherically symmetric? All right, the charge density is only a function of radial distance r. So now I create a surface at a distance r. It's going to be a spherical surface like that. You all see that? And now I know I have d that's only going to be a function of r. So this integral will become the integral. It's going to be a, a double integral of d, right, the d field of r, a r. I'm going to put the unit vector in there. I don't usually do that. And it's dotted with the differential surface. Now, do you remember what a differential surface is for the outer part of the surface in spherical coordinates? Anyone? Group four. Uh, it's going to be r d theta, right? That would be the one coming down at a constant distance r as I move d theta, right? And then it's going to be r sine theta times d phi. This is the horizontal one doing this. Right? The r sine, r sine theta is the projection on to the actual, uh, into the xy plane. And it's all got to be in the ar direction because it's spherically, I mean this thing is, uh, has got a constant distance r so it's pointing out. Rewriting this, this is the way it usually appears for the outer part of the sphere. It'll be r squared times the sine theta, and then it's going to be times d theta d phi, and it will be in the ar direction. Are you with me, guys? Now, let me just pause for a second make sure everybody's on the same page. Remember when you have unit vectors, uh, 
any two vectors a dot b are equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle between them. You all remember that? Right? If you have two vectors, well, if they're 90 degrees to each other, then the angle theta would be 90, and the cosine of 90 is 0, so it would be 0. And if they're aligned with each other, then theta would be 0, and the cosine of 0 is 1, and it would just be the first magnitude times the second. Y'all follow me? Now, with that in mind, if I have ax dot ax, what do I get? ax is a unit vector, has a length 1 in the x direction. What is that going to be? Just say zero. 1, right? ax is in the x direction, dot ax, the cosine of the end between them is 0, correct? Cosine of 0 is, is 1. So this is 1. What is ax dot ay? It's 0, right? They're perpendicular to each other. What is ax dot az? Zero as well. As a matter of fact, the only time it's non-zero is when these subscripts are the same. If it's an orthogonal system. Therefore, az dot ay would also be zero. Now, by the same token, if you're in cylindrical coordinates, what is a rho dot a rho? One. One. What is a rho dot a phi? Zero. And what is a rho dot a z? Zero. Huh? Zero as well. Correct, class? Y'all follow. That's cylindrical. What about spherical? What is a r dot a r? Zero. One. <laughs> what is a r dot a phi? Zero. All right. What is a r dot a Good job. Zero. Thank you. You get the idea. <laughs> Playing a little game here to help you remember it. Y'all with me? I said all that for one reason. When I come back here, you see how I have AR dot AR in that integration? All right. What is that? One. One. That's the reason I want to count that on the bottom right. So it goes away. That's my point. <coughs> okay. Now, Here's the next part of it. We're in spherical coordinates and we're doing an integration. Where does theta go from? Well, theta is measured from the z-axis, right? So if I'm straight up, theta would be? Zero. Zero. Very good. And if I'm straight down, theta would be? Pi. Pi. Very good. Now, what about phi? Phi is measured from the x-axis this way. It's in the xy plane, right? Correct? So phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. All the way around, right? 2 pi, correct. 0 to 2 pi. Okay. Y'all with me? Okay. Now that's the integral of d dot ds. I'm going to go ahead and do this one for you. All right. First of all, y'all agree that r is not a function of theta or phi, correct? r is a constant. Right, so I can take r squared dr out in front. Now, next, I integrate sine theta d theta. What's the integral of sine theta? Minus cosine theta, right? Minus cosine theta evaluated at pi. Well, cosine of pi is minus 1, where the minus is plus 1, right? Then it's minus the cosine of minus the cosine of uh, minus uh, cosine, of zero. cosine of zero is going to be one, but two minus is plus one. It's one and one is two. That's my point. So it's going to be two. That's the integral of the sine theta from zero to two pi. I mean zero to pi. It's always going to be two. Now when I integrate d phi, I get phi. Correct, class? Phi evaluated at zero is zero. And then phi evaluated at pi is 2 pi, so it's 2 pi minus 0, just 2 pi. Okay, so the bottom line on this, this becomes 4 pi r squared times dr. And I've got a comment right here. 
Look at this just for a second. Isn't 4 pi r squared just the surface area of a sphere? Isn't that right, class? If you have a sphere of a radial distance r, the surface area on that sphere is 4 pi r squared, correct? The volume in that sphere would be 4 thirds pi r cubed. But I'm not going to bother doing the volumetric stuff. I just want you to keep that in your mind. The only thing I'm doing is taking the surface area and multiplying it by the d field. I did that for the cylindrical case, and now I'm doing it for the spherical case. Well, that's equal to rho v dv. Now we've got to do that part. So when I look at rho v dv, first thing I put in is rho v. That's here. It's going to be a triple integral because it's a volumetric integral. And so it's going to be rho v zero times r divided by a. That's the actual volume. That's how the, how the charge density varies versus radial distance, correct? Now I have to put the differential unit of volume in here in spherical coordinates. Do you remember what it is? It's going to be what? R d theta would be the length this way, right? R d theta. The length this way would be r sine theta d phi, and the le length radially would be dr. If you, you don't know that, take a look in your books, make a note in your notes and say, look up volumetric differential. And you have to know that one. All right, so this is going to be times r squared times the sine of theta times the theta d phi dr. The order you put these in is unimportant. Doesn't matter if you have r and theta mixed up. Now over here on the limits, this is important now. Remember, we're in region one, we're for r less than a, right? Less than a equal to a. So when we put the limits on, well, first let's do the theta integration. Where does theta go from? North pole to south pole from zero to pi. Pi, right. All right, where does phi go from? From x-axis zero, winding the hands on a clock, back to zero is two pi, correct? Zero to pi. Right, zero to two pi. All right, now where does r go from? This is the one people usually trip over. Starts at zero, right? But it goes out, not to a, it goes to r, doesn't it? Goes to r. Goes from zero to r. And here's where I make a comment. I don't really... We're engineers, not mathematicians. We don't worry about certain things. But when you do an integration, you can't have the limits have anything to do with the differential. They've got to be distinct. So we know we're integrating r here. So what we actually do is just put an r prime. All right, that just indicates that's a dummy variable. It's going to integrate out. And then we're going to, our limit will have the r, the true r in it. So the next question is, what is this? Over here, I have my 4 pi r squared times dr. What's this going to be? And I want you to take a look at this. When I take a look at what's going on here, I've got an r cubed, don't I? And I've got rho v0 over a. So I'm going to take out the rho v0 over a first. I want to get that outside in front of the integral. It's a constant. Then I have, my first integration is sine theta d theta, correct? Well, the integral of sine theta is minus cosine theta. We just did this. When we evaluate that from 0 to pi, it's going to be 2. So it's times 2. Now I integrate d phi, and I get phi evaluated from 0 to 2 pi is... 2 pi, two right? Pi. Just 2 pi. Now, I need to do an integral of r prime cubed. What is the integral of r cubed dr? r to the fourth over 4, correct class? Right? It's in general, if I have the integral of, I, I put, I'll put r cubed dr, that's r to the fourth over four, right? That's 
that's a, a uh, indefinite integral or indefinite integral. In general, if you have anything x to the n, right, dx, that's going to be 1 over quantity n plus 1, x to the n plus 1, correct? Yep. Just it's basic integration. So now I come down here and I've got r to the fourth over 4 evaluated from 0 to r, or really just r to the fourth over 4. Do you all agree with that? I mean, did anybody do this problem, by the way? Anybody at all? No? Do you all realize I gave that to you? I did give that to you. That if you look, it's 335. I think it's in the home. You can check. Keep me honest. If I didn't put it up there, I've got to find out what went wrong. It should be there, right? Did, did you look at the one? Uh, I think, yeah, it should be there. Okay. It's Please. Three, you'll, you'll say 335. 3-3-5, right? No. It's not on the homework side. Okay. I'm going to check it right after class because, as a matter of fact, I'm going to check it right now. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because I take this and I, I, the problems I'm doing now are based on the homework I looked at. And if it didn't sync for whatever reason, I got a problem. When I'm making up my lectures, a lot of times I'm going to specifically do a homework problem I think that really exemplifies a concept. And I, I believe, oh, I'm really off base here, I gave this to you for homework, but if I didn't, I got to make sure I know why it didn't pop. Because I put this stuff in one note. So the one note. You are correct. It's not there. It, it is now. going to see your thing change in one second. Should see it in a second, and it's my bad. I don't know why. I guess that 3.35 at the end is what I was saying. Where's that? The one that you just deleted. That was there. Well, okay. yeah, I, I, I don't know. I guess. Y'all seen that though? Yes. Seen? yes. Okay. That's my bad. I think he. Uh, <coughs> I, I gotta tell you something. I paid it up last night. I don't know why it's not there. Unless, here's what I do oftentimes, guys. I have one note for my EMAG one classes from prior times. And a lot of times I copy the homework from there and just paste it into yours and I modify some of it. Either I didn't copy the entirety of it or something happened on the way out up there when I was copying and pasting. From now on, I'm going to go here. Anyway. So back to this problem, if I look at this, what do you see some of the things that can cancel? Remember, we're only in the region from R greater than zero, less than A, right? So one of the things that can cancel is the four pi, right off the bat. You all agree with that? Correct, class? What's the next thing that can cancel? R squared here, we got R to the fourth, get rid of one of them, got R squared, right? And in fact, this is the D field for R less than or equal to A. Now, do you all agree with that? Now we want the D field 
for r greater than a, all right, this one I think you're going to get. When I come out here, now I'm at a distance r, and it's greater than the radius a where the charge is all limited to, right? The charge density goes to zero outside that. Think of it like a golf ball charge. Now my Gaussian surface is out here at a distance r, but it's r greater than a. So I go through and I say, well, the integral of d dot ds, always start there and then put down what it is, is equal to the charge enclosed. In this case, it's going to be a triple integral, just like before, of rho v, rho v 0 over a times r r times r squared sine theta d theta d phi dr, just as before. Here's the one difference. I just put the charge density down, and I put the differential surface, and I'm going to do the integration. Here's the difference. Just look. My integration is still going to go from 0 to pi, and still from 0 to 2 pi. But here, it doesn't go from 0 to r, it goes from 0 to a, because now I'm outside of the region where the charge has a bond charge density unequal to zero, right? The only place it's, 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 it's something greater than zero is between zero and a. So now my limits go from zero to pi, from zero to two pi, and from zero to a. That's gonna be a constant value. You all follow me on that? The integrations have solid limits, not variables. So here, when I do the integration, well, I get d theta is going to be, the sine theta d theta integration is going to be 2. The d phi integration is 2 pi, so I get 4 pi for the first part, right? Then I've got r cubed dr, that's r to the fourth over 4, rho v 0 over a here. Rho to the fourth over four from zero to a would be a to the fourth over four. Y'all see what I'm doing here? I went ahead and did the integral of sine theta d theta minus cosine theta. Evaluated from zero to pi is gonna be just two. Then I integrate d phi from zero to two pi, get two pi, two pi times four pi, two pi times two is four pi. Then I integrate d, I mean r cubed dr, which is r to the fourth over four, four, and I put the limits from zero to a in there, and I get a to the fourth over four. Now, what's this integral going to be? Now I'm at a distance r greater than a, right? What's that going to be? The integral of d dot ds would be the d field, right? d of r times the surface area. What's the surface area of a sphere of radius r? Anyway. Four pi r squared. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's four pi r squared. In that, you have to know. You're going to have to know the surface area of a sphere and a cylinder very well. Now, what do you see happening here? I get my four. What cancels? Take this. How about the four pi? Four pi. Four pi. Uh, so I just erased it. That's my mistake. Get rid of an A also. Get rid of an A, yeah. That's a good place. <laughs> Make that Q, right? And then I kind of divide by R squared, don't I? And that, in fact, is D of R for R greater than A. I've got a comment, this is important. Now, anytime you have a finite amount of charge, regardless of how it's distributed, if all the charge is somewhat localized, it doesn't matter if it's on the z-axis or if it's a plate, or if it's, in this case, a ball. As you get further and further away, as R is going towards infinity, that thing looks like a point. So the D field will always turn into the D field from a point charge. 
And you know the D field from a point charge falls off this total charge over four pi f, four, over four pi r squared. And look, it's a function of r squared. That means we've done it right. As you get, because it's a finite amount of charge. And it's the same if it would be a rod of a certain charge. As I get further and further away, it starts looking as just one over r cubed, or one over r squared. Uh, number, uh -huh. number square law. That's right. And uh, the square law is very important because it's true for um, any type of electrostatics. By the way, the squared law is true for mass, too, for gravity. If gravity always varies as 1 over r squared, too, which is interesting. Those are two forces that are, um, I mean, they are ubiquitous. They're everywhere in the universe. There are two others, strong force and near force, that we know about. And there's speculation, there's a fifth force that couples all these. Do you all know that like light bends around planets? Do you know that or no? Yes. All right, well, that's a coupling between gravity and, and actual electromagnetics, because light is photons. It's what are propagating electromagnetic energy. And Einstein is the guy that came up with this because of uh, uh, the theory of general relativity and how, um, like we're at rest here technically, but actually we're under the influence of acceleration. Gravity's pulling us down. A zero acceleration environment, if, if I just let this go and it's falling, then it's in a zero uh, reference frame. <coughs> and uh, that's the state everything's tending to. And it's a long story on this one. But anyway, Einstein's, if you, if you look at this thing and the, um, the way he does this based on uh, general relativity and the principle that the speed of light is a constant in all reference frames, he comes up with a method of equating energy and mass, and that's the linkage. You ought to read about this sometimes. It's absolutely fascinating because he links, he finds out a linkage between electromagnetic propagating photons and gravitational force. And if you ever walk, if you ever look at some of this stuff, it's really fascinating. It always, it always is something of interest to me, and I think a lot of engineers. Okay, so that's Gauss's law for two problems. I'd ask you to make sure you go through all these problems and understand them before Friday uh, for the quiz. And uh, please, if you have questions, ask them next time. Okay, so that's really Gauss's law in a nutshell. Um, and anytime you have the D field, you can get D field easily. Just move, take a look at that. Divide D by epsilon, right? And you got the E field, which is nice. And Gauss's law, power is when, or the integral form, is when you have a symmetric charge distribution. This is the integral form of Gauss's law. Gauss is one of the great guys. As far as his contributions. Sir Isaac Newton, Gauss, um, there's so many, but Vermont, Vermont's the guy that gave us encryption. All this stuff happened before computers, too, which is amazing. Because they didn't have any way to numerically simulate all this stuff. They had to come up with mathematics. Gauss came up with integral calculus at the same time as German did. Hey. Sorry, Sir Isaac Newton. And then, uh, Sir Isaac Newton did, and then there was so much going on. But right around, say, 1480, 1490, and really 1850. Unbelievable scientific revelations. All right, now we do the point form of Gauss's law. This is cool. this in a nutshell. We could prove it. It's the divergence of D is equal to the volume charge density. That's it. Now, divergence is a mathematical operator. Let me just tell you where it comes from. <coughs> we know the integral form of Gauss's law was the integral of D dot dS over closed surface is equal to, if you think about a volume charge density, Rho V dV. You all with me on that? Now just listen to my argument and you'll understand what I'm saying. All right. Well, what happens as that surface gets smaller and smaller? 
when I think about this, if this is ds and it has a volume dv, well, if I take the limit as delta v or dv goes to zero, here's my point. As that's getting smaller, 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 there comes a point or rho v does not change because it, it doesn't change at all because the volume is so small. Do you all agree with that? So what I do is this. I say this looks like uh, rho v integral of dv. And this is going to be in the limit as dv goes to zero. So it's heading to zero. Rho v will be a constant. It's the integral of d dot ds. Well, d dot ds boils down to and this is kind of hard to show. He tries this in his book, but he tries it with Cartesians. If you look at this, and we have dz, dy, minus dz, <laughs> and so forth. The integral of d dot ds is going to be a differential surface in the z direction times d uh, x and dy, differential surface in the y direction times dy. Anyway, you're going to get all this differentials times differentials. Well, this whole thing will come down to some d dot ds here, and I'm just going to put a sum in. I'm going to just leave it alone and not mess with this. Well, when you divide that by dv here in the limit, you end up with this. He shows this in his book. I don't even waste time with that because, frankly, I'm not sure it really benefits the class, but he goes through this, and I'll give you the page number. He tries to do it pictorially. This is on page 161, and he goes through little rendition with the differential change in x in dx dy and dz and he shows you that uh, in equa or equation 3.57 uh, what the uh, divergence goes to now I'm going to just give you the bottom line of this thing. you can look there but it's based on mathematics if you're in Cartesian coordinates, divergence of D, this is in the back of your book, on the last page inside, or actually inside the cover. Divergence of D in Cartesian coordinates is D dx dx plus D dy mod plus D dz of dz. That would be Cartesian coordinates. In cylindrical coordinates, divergence of D would be equal to 1 over rho, D D rho of rho times D rho, plus 1 over rho times D D rho, actually, for me as you where this is. You don't have to write it down. This is in the uh, on the last page on the inside cover. If you look at this divergence of the first operation, and that's what I'm writing. So this is going to be times the phi dz. I mean the. Not d rho, pardon me. This is 1 over rho times phi d phi plus d dz dz here. These two are the same. And finally, in spherical, divergence of d is equal to. 1 over r squared d dr of r squared times d of r plus 1 over r 
sine theta times d over d theta d theta and it's going to be times um, this is going to be theta times sine theta pardon what it's a d theta sine theta You guys put the sine theta operator in here. Yeah, he does it there. I'll tell you, uh, this is it's sine. It's really, yeah. Uh, D of theta. That's right. Times sine of theta. And then finally, he's going to have plus. 1 over r times d d b. I think he's doing it this way, but actually. Yeah, that's 1 over, oh, one over r sine theta, my bad. This is 1 over r sine theta. And this is going to be just d b here. And you should have this down like that. Now, the reason I'm hesitant on some of this, there's a couple reasons. One is a big one. What they'll, some people, what you'll see done is when you do this derivative here, the derivative of r squared will just be 2r, then it's times dr plus, then r squared times the derivative dr. This can be broken into two parts. Here, you can go ahead and take the derivative of d theta times sine theta, and then the sine theta here and here will cancel on that part, plus, and it's going to be d theta times the derivative of sine theta is minus cosine theta. Then you get a co minus cosine theta over sine theta, and that will be uh, either the cotangent or 1 over the tangent of theta. So there's different ways to write this. This is probably the most common, and it's in Wentworth's book. All right, you don't have to know this one and this one. I will give those to you, but this one you have to know. All right, and when you work with these things, you can't help but remember. It's going to take you hours on this stuff. I mean, you're going to have to spend time on this because some of this, these concepts are a little abstract and the formulas get a little tedious to do. But that's, in a nutshell, the divergence of D is rho V. So let me just give you a couple simple examples of how to calculate rho V from D. And then we've calculated how to get D from rho V just before that. That was the integral form calcium stuff. Right? Given rho V, we can calculate D. So suppose I have a D field. This is a typical problem. Of uh, 3xy, all right, times the sine of 2z ax plus um, 3y squared cosine of 5z ax, I mean ay, pardon me, y. And then plus 3y az. Right. There is a field that's just used for the purposes of demonstrating the divergence operator. And I want you to do the I want to find out what rho v is. This is like a quiz question. All right, so what's rho v? Well, I have to take the divergence on. What's the divergence? Do it with divergence of D. Look at this. We're in Cartesian, right? So it's dx, it's the derivative with respect to x of d of x. What is d of x? The coefficient of ax, right? So this is d of x, right? And this is dy. And this is dz, right? 
Okay, what's the derivative of this with respect to x? It's 3y sine of 2z, right? So it's 3 times y times the sine of 2z. Those are all look like constants, right? Now, what's the derivative of dy with respect to y? Uh, 3, is that that or no? The derivative of y squared y. is 2y, right? Six. So it's 6 y times cosine of 5z, right? And what's the derivative of 3y with respect to z? Zero. Zero, right? Just zero. So this would be the derivative, I mean this would be divergence of uh, d. <coughs> And I could go a step further, and I do a lot of times. So I want you to evaluate rho v at x equal 1, y equal 1, z equal 0. Right? So now what's this going to be? Well, when x equals 1, is there anything that varies with x there? Y'all see that? When y equals 1, what happens? Well, I got 3 times 1, right? All right, so this is 3. And then I got 6 times 1, that's 6. So I have 3 as a coefficient in the first term, 6 as a coefficient in the second, right? Now, I made z 0. When z is 0, what is the sign of 0? 0, right? So this is 0, correct? Plus, and this is 6 times, what's the cosine of 0? Cosine of oh, 0 is 1, yes. right? Yes. <laughs> but it would be 5 in that. I mean, so in that, in that, that means this would yeah. just be 6, correct? Cosine of 5 times 0 is cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. Y is 1. It's simply 6. That's it. That's my point. Now, I'll ask you stuff like this, and you have to get it right. <laughs> You gotta make sure you know how to do it. You clear on this, guys? That's a divergence for a given D field. Now, in Wentworth's book, he gives us some problems. And so this is section 3.8. As a matter of fact, why don't you do this? Do all the problems 3.38 through 3.41 for Friday, because they're easy, and they're quick to do. And I put the solutions in homework six, I think. That was 3.31 through 3.38? 3.38 through 3.41. In other words, all the problems in the section 3.8 in the uh, back of the book. Um, and if you look at that, we could we could just talk our way through some of these. Do you have your books with you guys? If you do, I can talk my way through it. Really, do you have a book? If you don't mind. All right. I'll do this. So this is the first one, 3.38. Is determine the charge density at 304. Nathan, do you have a book? I didn't bring it with me. You can you can look on um, Okay. Right there. Uh, yeah, all right. So the first one it says determine the charge density at the point 304. If the electric flux density is given as so they give you a D in the A Z direction, right? Now the minute you see that, you know the only derivative you need for the divergence is with respect to Z. Y'all see that? So what's the derivative of uh, X, Y, Z with respect to Z? Last zero. No, no, with respect to Z, it would be X, Y. X, y. All right, so x, y, and then that would be it. And he says, evaluate, we got x, y at the point 3, uh, 4, and 0. Well, if x is 3 and y is 4, it's 3 times 4 would be 12, wouldn't it? Yeah. You good with that, guys? Yeah. All right, that's how you do it. Next one, they give you it as 2 rho a rho plus sine theta a z. All right, what's that one going to be? 
Oh, they say find the electric flux passing through the surface. Uh, let me do, help you with this one. This is a good problem. See, these require you to think a little more. And you know, one thing about engineering, it requires you not just to recite stuff, but you have to think and reason through a lot of stuff. I, I say this once in a while. Most engineers are pretty good at chess. They at least enjoy chess because it's similar. There's a whole lot of things, concepts, principles, and then you have to apply them to solve certain problems to get certain outcomes. So, matter of fact, I had a kid in my class that I taught, I think it was Enam 2, I taught him that course, and his name was Stephen Mahan. Stephen was an African-American student, about 33, 35, somewhere in there. He had been in the US Army, and he struck me as very intelligent, very serious. He came into my office one time, and my graduate student at the time and myself were working problems in electromagnetics. We, we were doing research in electromagnetics, but Stephen had questions about certain homework problems, I guess. So he came in, and I had a chess game up. Did I tell you guys this story or not? No, so. no. All right, so I had a chess game up, like if you know what chess, does anybody know what chess master is? Mm -hmm. All right, it was, but it was on the highest level, similar to chess master, one chess master. So he sees it, <coughs> and you know what I'm talking about, Eric Locke, he's in there, I'm trying, why not just get him out of the office? And he's, and he comes over, he's got his, he says, do you play chess? I'm like, yeah, well, I try. So, well, anytime you want to play, let me know. So uh, he, he asked me another thing about electromagnetics. He asked him to point something out and tell him to do something at the board. Meanwhile, go back to Faircloth, who's now very rich and owns his own company. He got his PhD in This is when he was beginning grad school. <laughs> Both of these guys are super successful. So, so he's looking at this thing. And he says something else. I'm like, why don't you play? Give him something to do. Keep him out of my head. So he sits down and starts playing. I'm looking. After about eight moves, he's beating the computer. I mean, if he's up, there's a, a rank that you have. Nobody, this is on the grandmaster level. Right? I usually get creamed after 10 moves. I'm already in a bad place. By 20, I'm usually wrong. He's playing and playing. And he's asking me questions as he turns and plays. He beats the thing at the highest level. Now, it wasn't chess master. It was a freeware version of this kind. Now, who are you? He was a federation master in chess. He was a champion in Georgia. I'm so glad I didn't play him for money. Georgia, <laughs> Alabama, <laughs> Tennessee, and Florida. And he, he ranked high in the US Open. This is a guy who's competing nationally slash internationally. In these tournaments, you gotta pay an entry fee. Which means most of the time, if it's like bass or anything else, any tournament you play, you got sponsors that pay you, pay for your entry fee for you to play. And he was living in Georgia, Fort Benning area. He, he had been out of the Army a short time, and um, I think the Army was paying for something. And that guy ended up being an international master. If you know anything about chess, in order to become a grandmaster, you have norms to make. There's federation master, then there's international master. And then for grandmaster, there's norms. Now, I don't know if he's a grandmaster now or not. And he's telling me, oh, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And he told me who he was when we talked. Told me how he got into chess in the U.S. Army, and you know when you're in the armed services, especially the Navy, but I guess the Army too, you have a lot of time that you can't leave. You just got you're confined to an area, so you take up things like cards, chess, uh, you hobbies. I hit, and, and this guy, this one guy said, you know, you're pretty good. You should read about this. They're playing these fast games, I think, for money, speed chess. So. This kid did. He just didn't learn because he's very bright and he's also very enthusiastic about that game. And I watched him, and this is absolutely true on ICC, it's the International Chess Server, it's an internet thing. It costs money to play there if you're not titled, if you're not an international federation or grandmaster. You got to pay a certain amount. Only the very best go there. Uh, like Magnus Carlsen, if you know who he is, he's the world champion, which is people like that, world-class chess players, and I watched. So I was watching on there, 
had one of these two week memberships they give you for free. And he's playing Nigel Short. Do you know who Nigel Short is anyway? He was a world champion in chess. Like Kasparov, like Spassky, like Bobby Fischer, like Magnus Carls. He's playing him on a, these are three minute games. By the way, this is a very common game. Three minutes apiece on the, these grandmasters plays. So if you really know what you're doing, you can cruise it. And out of five games, he beat Nigel Short, three of them. That's unheard of. Nobody beats Nigel Short, but somebody like Bobby Fischer or Gary Kasparov. And I, that's what I realized. You know, engineering attracts the best and the brightest, they say. I, I, I've had it in my classes some of the smartest people probably in the world. Literally, I've had two or three. I had the one savant, uh, I think I told you about Sonny Oke, didn't I tell you about that? Yes. All right, I mean, when you get people that bright, you, you can't help but appreciate them. And I encourage you to, I'm over, um, but I figured that story's worth it. But that kid, I'll never forget. <laughs> Go look him up, his name's Stephen Muhammad. He, he has something called a chess drum. <laughs> he's, he's amazing. I think he might be retired now, because here's what happens with chess, and I'm not kidding. When you hit about 40, 35 to 40, you realize, you're not as quick as these young kids. You're just not. And you get these young kids that are, some of them are 13, 14 years old. They're grandmasters, right? You can't, I listen to one guy who's a grandmaster named Ben Feingold. He's kind of, he's got this really soured way of putting out information, but it's funny because it's his own shit. And he was talking about, he was playing a 13 year old the other day. He said, I was lucky to get a draw. That kid cringe. Yeah. And this is a great test. He says, you know, you just, at a certain point in time, you just got to say, I'm hanging it up. 